Hello again, I'm Bryony Perdue and this is Liquid Gold TV brought to you by Braybone Whiskey. Whiskey. Now this week we're going to focus in on time and whiskey and how important age is when it comes to investment. So fill your glass with something special as I have done and join me for a dram. Today we have Daryl Haldane from White & Mackay. Now he spent over a decade in the industry spending time as an ambassador, brand manager, educator at Diageo and most recently with White & Mackay. Now, Daryl, Head of Whiskey Experience sounds like a pretty damn good job title. Can you tell me a bit more about what that entails? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's great because you, you work across different functions. So, you know, when we make whiskey, there's lots of other areas uh, of marketing, whiskey making, you know, the blending team, the whiskey making team, and you've obviously got the distilleries as well. So uh, I work across all three teams um, and try to work with the whiskey makers, the guys up at the distilleries and, you know, the, the brand teams to try and make sure, you know, what we're saying about the products is true and make sure the information is, is nice and solid, you know? Fantastic. Uh, Wine Mackay have released some incredibly venerable single malts from Dalmore, uh, the Dalmore 62 and the Dalmore 64 Trinitas come to mind. Uh, now, even casual whiskey drinkers are familiar with the concept that older typically means like more valuable but at 64 years, there are very few whiskies on the market to rival that age. Can you expand a little bit, please, Daryl, on the importance of age when it comes to whiskey? I think the um, the reality is, yeah, whiskey is rarer the older it gets because there's less of it. 40 or 50 years ago, I don't think people knew how the market could change, you know, to where we are today. So it's, it's this new territory for malt whiskey. The carefulness of a whiskey maker with whiskies that are of that age is essential because it becomes more delicate the older it gets and you really need to be careful with how it's maturing. Absolutely, that makes perfect sense. Now Neil from Brayburn Whiskey has joined us as well to talk about the effect that special releases and other certain uh, differences in the market have on cask investment. Now from a cask perspective, uh, what does the, uh, the sort of X factor of these amazing brands, what does that mean for casks? Well, I think when when you're investing into a cask of whiskey, you really have to look into the brand itself and look into what that brand is actually doing on the market. Now, Dalmore, I keep using Dalmore here as part of the White Mackay Group, but they're, they're very well branded. They're very well out there on the market. And Richard Patterson is a superstar of whiskey. So when you actually invest in a cask of whiskey, which has all of these tick boxes, which I like to call them, They've got the brand awareness, they've got the, the marketing, they've got the superstar behind them, they've got the, the massive releases at 62 years of age. When you invest into that cask of whiskey, you've got a lot of security and safety behind that brand because it's not speculative, it's not, it's real. You're buying into a brand which has the people, it has the branding, it has the marketing, and it's also got the scope for you in the future. So that's something we definitely look for at Brayburn Whiskey is offering someone the full package of a cask. And to expand on that, Neil, uh, is that one of the reasons that you would recommend investing in a White and Mackay cask? Yeah, definitely. When we when we ever get a White and Mackay brand on our list, a Dalmore, Fetacam, uh, Jura, they are the most pop, one of the most popular casks or casks that we sell. Very popular whiskey with investors. They know the brand and they want to own a piece of the White & Mackay group, and that is the bottom line. They love, they, they love the whiskey. With obviously the whiskey investment angle at Brayburn, uh, Daryl, um, why, when it comes to the age of a whiskey, can you sort of describe the landmarks in an aging process for a whiskey, the sort of transition points when it's in a cask? Yeah, it depends on the cask. It really does. Casks are like uh, people, you know, I'm, um, I'm one of five children, and we grew up in the same house, from the same families, you know, but we're all very different. We all have our own personality quirks. My brother's tall with dark hair, it's really annoying. Um, <laughs> you know, and, it, and it, casks are the same. They can be from the same trees, the same forests, but for whatever reason, the way they re interact with our spirit can change, you know, quite significantly. So the interaction between the wood is, is the big thing, but once you've got that down, you can you can sample it after three years. You can sample it when you know as it progresses, see how it develops. But yes, there's landmarks. We always talk about twelve year olds. We always talk about eighteen year olds in the market, and these are landmark age statements that people look at as you know a sign of great quality. 
But that's something you have to do all the time. Because remember that alcohol content drops as well, to a point, especially when you're talking about rare whiskies, the, 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 the guys at Rayburn will be working with, you know, in the end, they'll go under 40%, which no longer qualifies them to be called single malt scotch whiskey. So again, as it gets older, you've got to be more careful. You have to keep checking it more regularly. It becomes more labor intensive. For the investor who is looking for the next Macallan, for the next Dalmore, what are the sort of things that someone should look out for? What distilleries do you reckon? Yeah, it's, um, oh, it's hard to say because it, it looks like, you know, the, the, the whiskies that people like to invest in tend to be rich, full-bodied single malts. Um, so, you know, you've got Dalmore and Macallan that you've called out there that are two whiskies very similar to that. Lots of investment in sherry casks from both organisations as well. So something that's aged well um, in sherry casks that has a nice robust spirit which allows it to mature for a long time. Because something that's too light just will not deal with time in those casks. Oh, fantastic. Neil, would you add anything to that? Yeah, it's probably touching on what we were speaking about earlier on. If you're looking for a big brand or an up and coming brand, you really want to look into the investment in the distillery. You want to look into the marketing of that distillery. There's a lot of distilleries out there who are happy being drinkable whiskies. They love to be a 12 year old, 15 year old, nice drinking whiskey and they're not pushing to be a Macallan but there's all these distilleries out there who are actually looking to maybe knock Macallan off the perch by releasing these special brands and if you've got those special brands out in the market when you have a cask of whiskey at 10 years of age and you see these big brands coming out it gives you a lot of scope for your investment so when I'm often cast to my clients I always look into who owns a distillery where the distillery is actually located what bottles they've released it just gives our clients a massive level of security knowing that their cask could one day be the next X Factor cask. It's part of the excitement, isn't it? If you love whiskey and you love investing in whiskey, then you sort of want to keep the history of things going, but also look forward. You don't yeah. want to just sort of stay in exactly the same place all the time. It's part of the fun of it, I guess. Yeah. Um, Daryl, how do you reckon the whiskey market's going to change over the next 10 years? Will the market run with the bears or the bulls? Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, if I get this right, I'll, I'll be retired in 10 years time, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I, I do think there'll still be a rise in the demand for rare whiskey. I, I think people are intrigued by it. I think they're fascinated by it. I think they're delighted by it when they open it and taste it. Um, I think people will still invest quite heavily behind rare whiskies. I hope that the whiskies are consumed. I hope they're not all just going into collections that fill cupboards and uh, you know get sold at auction all the time. Um, I would like to see, as we we're just talking about there, you know, people bottling their whiskies, sharing it with their friends, having a fantastic time with it. And that's where I hope it goes. That's where I see it going personally. Um, and and I, I hope as well the image of whiskey is improved with that as well. Well, that's kind of what everyone who enjoys a whiskey, that's what you would hope that they think as well. And I think that even when you've got people buying uh, a really, a really exclusive, really rare whiskey to keep, at some point someone's going to buy that and want to drink it and share it on that anniversary, on that special occasion. So I would hope that it continues to be for the pleasure as well as for the investment prospects. Uh, Daryl Haldane from White and Mackay joined by Neil Brown from Brayburn Whiskey talking about the fact that you can invest in whiskey and enjoy it for yourself, bottles and casks. Thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you so much, Neil, for joining me. Thank, thank you, Bryony. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Joining us from Fife, we have Graham Kilgower, who is a director of Right Track Training and also a keen public speaker. He is of course, most importantly, a client of Brayburn Whiskey and has an amazing history of whiskey in the family. Not only was his grandfather director of Ballantines, but his great grandfather was involved in the barley malting business in Kirkcaldy, where he is now based. So, Graham, are you planning to invest for a short period or a longer period of time and why? Um, well, the initial investment was to be a longer period. 
as, as we've discussed, the longer you have the whiskey, the more valuable it can get. But at the same time, one of the other reasons I looked at investing into, into the whiskey industry was to see about the opportunity of independent bottling as well. I think um, as well as having your own cast, I think it'd be even cooler to have your own range of and, uh, bottling and, and bottles. And that's something that could be looked at in the future. Sam had mentioned the prospect of two, two casts a year of an investment. And one of the things that I would like to think is that there'll be some of these would be made for investment and some of these would be maybe, made, maybe be made with the prospect of looking at mixing and matching with some casks or potentially just bottling them up and having something there that might be slightly bespoke and a little bit different. I quite like, yeah. Sounds like a great plan, a great balance to have. Now we are also joined by Sam Gordon who is managing the account that Graham has with Brayburn Whiskey. Um, and I was... Sam, would you add anything else to that? It's always up to, in this case, Graham, how long he wants to hold the cask for. Personally, with uh, casks that I invest in, my recommendation is always hold for as long as you can, uh, within reason, of course. Um, you know, if you look at buying something, you know, at the age of five, you might be paying twenty-eight pounds per bottle, which is the unit price of a cask. And um, if you look at price on the market of bottlings from the same distillery, you will see a steady incline you know up past the age of 10 towards 15 and then that does accelerate you know when you start to get to the age of 18 21 25 as whiskey single malt whiskey becomes more scarce so um certainly medium to longer term rather than in short term makes perfect sense and i was just going to see if uh, sam you would contribute to why you thought whiskey might be a good investment for graham yeah um i started speaking with graham last year and it actually took us quite a long time as we discussed earlier to find the cast for Graham. Um, like a lot of people he loves whiskey, he's got that clear passion but also the investment side Graham understands maturation, he understood already without my knowledge of how whiskey matures, buy something relatively young, give the cast time to mature so um, both aspects, he loves whiskey which is certainly one thing uh, but at the same time, the investment aspect, buying a cask young and giving it to his mature. Graham, are there any particular regions that you love and are there any particular brands that you favour of whisky? I must admit, until recently, finding the right taste and flavour was, was something I was very keen on. And, and once I found a, a whisky, I enjoyed it. But over the course of lockdown, I've enjoyed sampling a lot more to try and broaden my horizons a little bit to see. <laughs> Predominantly, uh, I'm not much of a smokehead, as they sort of say, so I do enjoy a, a slight bit of smokiness, but I prefer mainly the Speyside area for whiskies. Uh, as I say, I, I do enjoy trying the odd whisky from further over the islands and things, but mainly mainly stick to that sort of region there. I was just going to say, I actually got Graham on to, uh, well, I think he tried it before, but about the 14-year-old yeah. and cask. Remarkable. Remarkable. Yeah. The, we were yeah. talking about the maturation of whisky and things like that, and the, the difference between uh, the different cast finishing whiskey with the, the Caribbean cast that you know it really does give a completely different flavour and something that I've enjoyed and, and I've been trying to hold off on it I've just been trying to drip it in every now and then oh. it's too difficult <laughs> kind of to have one you've got to keep going you know absolutely we've obviously just talked about the the variety of tastes and appeals when you want to drink a whiskey but sam what was it that led you to recommend the portfolio of whiskies that graham now invests in for him yeah well well graham's quite a new client of mine um so he actually bought his first cask at the beginning of this year uh, we decided upon a highland park uh, 2017 cask so a very very young highland park um we also looked to create Glenallachy um, a couple of times. We were looking at a couple of distilleries that Graham would like to buy from, and it took me a, a while um, to get something, you know, which I could say this is something that Graham likes, but also something that has some serious investment potential. So uh, the Highland Park is, you know, one of the best. Um, he can buy this cask at the age of two, three years old. Um, I've seen the value of Highland Park casks in their 20s, 25, 30 years old. Um, and it's exceptional. So um, again, you know, the whiskey aspect, of course, but um, Graham buying Young, the Highland Park cask, he's going to give it time to mature. And with age, it will become a very, very valuable cask of whiskey. 
And have you managed to have a have a taste of any of, the, of your casks yet, Graham? Uh, not yet, no. Um, the, 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 Sam actually, we made the final sort of agreement on this not long into the, the sort of lockdown period. So um, I've been champing at the bit really to try and get up <laughs> and, and he's telling me all about this fascinating uh, new bonding shed that uh, Brayburn have got and it's got its own sampling room inside it and all I can think about is as soon as lockdown's finished, <laughs> I'll be straight to the car and finding the whole there. car and getting up there <laughs> sampling. But, uh, you know, it's something that's been, been uh, for me, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, through all this. I can sort of focus on, won't be long before I get to sample my whiskey and uh, it'll be great, you know, I'm looking forward to that. What was it about um, Brayburn and how is it that you found out about whiskey investment that made you choose to do so? I, I originally, for my 30th uh, last year, I was given a firkin of um, the uh, Lindor's Abbey. Which is so that had sort of kick started something that had always been at the back of my mind. And I thought to myself, I'd quite like to do a little bit more. And of course, a firkin uh, was, was the gift, but I'd like a sort of bigger hogshead and make it more of an investment rather than just something of sentimental value. So that was one of the reasons I, I looked online, I looked at a few different options. And for me to make this first major investment, I wanted to make sure it was right. And I wanted to also make sure it was with the right people. And if you're going to be putting that kind of money into these things, particularly in the time that we're, that we're in just now, it's very important that you have that trust there. And, and I, I definitely felt that with Sam and, um, you know, it's, it's been great. And we've, we've been in touch since and it's, you know, it's more of a, a friendship relationship possibly as well as, a, as, a, as an investment one, you know? We've described it before, haven't we, Sam, as a long-term relationship. It is, you know, and, and to talk about that, you know, Graham's bought a two-year-old cast, you know, so that means that we are going to be working together, of course, with the relationship that we've now got, you know, he's going to buy, I believe, at least two casks a year, is um, kind of your objective, so it's going to be a very, very long-term relationship, and, um, you know, giving something like a Highland Park, you know, we're going to look at some Glen Allergies next, see if I can get something from uh, some of those types of distilleries within Speyside. Um, and with time, again, you know, the cast will become very valuable. So it's um, it's a really exciting prospect, very exciting. Can't argue with that. I think that that actually draws this to a nice close because we've talked to Graham Kilgower about his uh, choice to invest with Brayburn Whiskey and Sam Gordon from Brayburn about what it is that uh, time and whiskey, what is important about time and whiskey and uh, the investment and just the fact that having it for longer makes it part of the family by the sounds of it. Last week, in preparation for this week's performance, I had the great pleasure of chatting to Ollie Seymour Marsh of the rock and roll band The Blue Jays. And here is what he had to say. Hello, Bryony. How are you doing? Yeah, great, thank you. Nice and sunny here. How are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really good. Really good. Yes, I'm admiring your, uh, your little selection there behind you, just behind your right shoulder. And I, and I yours, he was, it's good. We've both got this little setup. up. <laughs> uh, the Blue Jays obviously specialise in rock and roll, 1950s, 60s uh, music. And authenticity is really important when it comes to that music. What is it that led you towards that period of music and how did you get into it? I think for uh, a long time, I didn't really know much about 1950s rock and roll at all. Uh, and it was actually working backwards that I sort of started to realise how, how important the 1950s was as an era in shaping popular music. Uh, and, you know, any, anything from the Beatles who would cite the Everly Brothers and Chuck Berry as two of their greatest influences through to the Rolling Stones who would cover songs by Buddy Holly and you know, Elvis Presley. They, all of these artists cited those 50s rock and rollers as being the, the real, you know, the, the, the guys that <clears throat> kind of defined what, you know, what rock and roll would become. You know, there was no such thing as a teenager before Elvis Presley um, turned up. And it was it, that there were just adults and there were kids you know that it was really strange you know he, he defined what it meant to be a teenager and changing the way that people would perceive um perceive that particular age group and with that age group came this sort of rebellious raw energetic sensual sexual music that was rock and roll and uh, and the more i realized that the more i wanted to find out 
Are you finding ways as a band with the Blue Jays to perform whilst in lockdown? Are you finding ways to connect and make uh, live shows for your fans? Yeah, we have been releasing isolation uh, videos, isolation recordings, and um, we've been quite ambitious. We've done we've done some some numbers that have got eight, I think maybe even nine of us in, um, and it's been it's been great. We've I think we started with about thirteen thousand followers online, and we we. We've grown. I think we've got another three thousand since um, lockdown started. So weirdly, online we've actually become a hell of a lot more popular, uh, just from you know from everyone sitting sitting at home wondering what to do and just flicking through you know Facebook going, oh yeah, I'll check that out. It's nice to have something that you can actually share that's really positive and uplifting at this current moment in time because it makes you feel useful. It makes you feel happier yourself to be able to give people something which they can enjoy. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, I hope I hope we do that. We get some really lovely feedback and it's it's really lovely. It, it's definitely, it's a way of being able to connect that I don't think any of us had anticipated, but it feels like a real lifeline at the moment. Absolutely, I could not agree more. Ollie, we've been asking each of our guests to describe what their desert island dram would be. Which whiskey, if you could only have one whiskey for the rest of your life, which whiskey would you choose? Which would be your old reliable? So I think if it's gonna, if we're gonna drink it, you know, all the time, I, I, I'm not gonna go cask strength because you know I want it to be palatable. I want this stuff to be, you know, kind of. You're probably gonna be having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and sounds like a great island. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. Uh, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a fancy bottle. It's gonna be a bottle that reminds me of a really wonderful time and every time that I drank it, I would remember this time. And it's, it's a bottle of uh, Flora and Fauna, uh, the Dal Ewan Flora and Fauna. And I think it's, I think it's a 16 year old uh, Flora and Fauna. And it's really nice, kind of soft sherry characteristics, a little bit meaty, quite chewy, but very, very easy going, really Moorish. And uh, I didn't even know that the Dal Ewan, I didn't even know that Dal Ewan as a distillery existed until my brother and I went on a distillery tour uh, when I was about 21. And, uh, and that was the time that I kind of had my eyes open to it. And I just remember having my mind blown by all of these incredibly beautiful distilleries. Uh, and the Dal Ewan was one of the bottles that we took back to a, a little boffy uh, one night. And so that bottle reminds me of that occasion. So I would, I would take a, a Dal Ewan 16. I just want to thank you so much for this fantastic talk about music, about whiskey. You're very welcome. Well, it's been great. I, I, my two favourite things. So, I mean, it's been lovely to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with all things Blue Jays. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Especially for Brayburn Whiskey, here are rock and roll sensation, the Blue Jays. I think we can all agree that that was time well invested. 
Thank you for joining me and I'll see you again next week for another Dram.